Good afternoon. Thank you all for coming. I'm Laura Demers, TD Curator of Education and Outreach Fellow at the Power Plant, and I'm pleased to welcome you to this afternoon's program. As you may know, this conversation follows the opening of the Power Plant's Winter 2020 exhibition season, which we celebrated last night. We are now excited to launch into our, program, uh, our public programs spanning Sunday scenes, workshops, artist talks, film screenings, literary events, and more. We are also pleased to provide increased accessibility for some of these programs. Today's conversation is supplemented by simultaneous ASL interpretation. To learn about our public programs in more detail, please grab a program guide or visit thepowerplan.org. To focus on this afternoon's speakers, Nafus Ramirez Figueroa was born and currently lives in Guatemala. He holds a BFA from Emily Carr University and an MFA from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Some recent solo exhibition venues include the New Museum in New York in 2018, the House Esters, Krefeld, Germany in 2017, and the Tate Modern in London 2015. He has participated in various group exhibitions, including the 57th Venice Biennial in 2017. Ramirez Figueroa is a recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship, a Franklin Furness Award, an Academy Schloss Solitude Fellowship, the Arco Comunidad de Madrid for Young Artists, the Dad Berliner Kunstler Program, and the 2017 Mies van der Rohe Award. Lauren Barnes is curator of exhibitions at the power plant. Prior to this, she was curator at the Hepworth Wakefield and assistant curator at Tate Liverpool, both in the UK. She holds MA and BA degrees in art history from the Courteau Institute of Art, University of London. Publications include Mary Reed Kelly and Patrick Kelly, We Are Ghosts from 2017, and Maria Lasnig, 2016. Please join me in welcoming Nafus and Lauren. Um, thanks very much, Laura. Um, thanks everyone for coming. Can you hear? Great, good. Um, so it's the first thing I want to say is it's been a real pleasure working with Nafus on this exhibition. Um, it feels like it's been uh, it's been an important project to my mind for the way that it has for the first time brought together a number of Nalfus's different uh, works really from the past decade um, in a single exhibition. Um, and this feels like a particularly important thing to do because it's Nalfus's first major exhibition in Canada. And you're both Guatemalan and Canadian and it feels a, there's a sense of... Uh, homecoming in a way in the exhibition I would uh, I would say um, I, I was reflecting on like on what this process of making the exhibition has been like and um, well one of the things that um, that feels very significant is the fact that I've really learned so much about the history of Guatemala and about the various uh, histories and fictions and uh, theories and stories that make up that history. And I think that really um, speaks a lot to the importance of your work that it is bringing to light those things. Um, and I think another, another thing that really has define this um, this process of making the show is that it has been equally uh, uh, the things that we've been talking about and thinking about have been equally uh, tragic and horrifying as very funny and uh, that there are these kind of equal threads of humor and horror that really run through um, all of your work so I hope that we might be able to talk about um, the way that the you navigate between um, these two things um, as one of the threads of the conversation. I think we have um, almost an hour to talk and we have then time for um, questions and discussion and, um, and all of those things. Um, perhaps it, it would be good to talk about your biography and your trajectory 
first of all, because I think it's not to, it's absolutely not to diminish the universal significance and the resonance across um, many audiences and viewers and visitors um, to say that your biography really has informed the way that um, that your work has come about. Is that fair to say? Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's always been um, something challenging myself to balance what actually inspires me and what the work is. I think I could probably do the same work without sharing biographical data. It, it is possible. But, um, and um, I think also, um, I think also like, um, well, you know, I, going to exhibitions in the 90s when um, identity politics first came out, was a bit um, tiresome in a way because uh, I forget who said, but uh, you know, sometimes um, um, artists who were maybe um, not part of the mainstream felt like they had to perform their identity. So always conscious of trying not to do that. So also trying not to give a simple narrative. Um, and also, um, you know, like if I do use my biography or I speak about the history of Guatemala, it's also been stories that are interesting or that Guatemalans themselves don't know. So it's nothing that's quite obvious. Um, yeah, but it's, um, um, I mean, yeah, there was that risk that, um, that maybe it's so specific that nobody could relate to it. And I think a way I've, I've done to, to move around that is in most of my exhibitions, there's no uh, wall text and there's no um, artist statement. So um, it's been interesting to, to actually show art that way. And, and that's been, I guess, in, in my grad school when we had the um, MFA whatever show, um, yeah, we weren't allowed to put a artist statement. So that was, uh, I guess that was the first time it was, it was a, a challenging thing because I went to undergrad in Emily Carr and there we had to a full wall of text to justify uh, the little white thing that I put on the wall. <laughs> what so did you show Emily Carr then? Well, uh, it was also interesting and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I think I know the thing that it, is it the that intestine yes. thing? Yes. C yes. Maybe you could describe it. Well, um, I collaborated with my mother, and um, she made um, the large intestine out of crochet, and then I put it together, and it was part of my. It was, but she fabricated it, so it's also interesting. Um, you know, her uh, crocheting all these parts, like, like, of the large intestine, including like the rectum and blah, blah, blah. So, um, how did you describe it or talk about it in the wall text then? What was, what well, was I talked about, I, it was, I talked about uh, my interest in, um, um, what did I talk about? It was a long time ago. It was, um, <laughs> I graduated in 2006, so it's a long time ago. But um, I don't remember, but I did have to, it had to go through many committees for six months, so. <laughs> the text, wow. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes, so yeah. Um, but yeah, it must be somewhere. Um, but anyway, yeah, and but at SAIC, I, I couldn't do that, so it was kind of liberating and nice to to not do that, and um, but of course, if if you're showing in a museum, blah, blah blah, of course, it becomes more a little bit more didactic relationship between art and audience. So you're there's an agenda to educate the audience. S so I think you cannot get away with just not putting any any text. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And but how is it? How has it felt the way that um, that in? Th I'm just gonna switch. Um, yeah, I suppose we have been, uh, we have been, I suppose in the 
didact or I don't like calling it didactic material. It's more interpretive, right? Um, but in the material that we've provided alongside the works in the show, I guess the main thing we've been trying to do is um, provide some kind of contextual mm -hmm. reference points. Um, but one of the things that's been um, really interesting also about this process is that, um, I mean, I think for many of these works in the exhibition, one could write five different captions for them and each of them would be equally valid and interesting and would provide um, another kind of angle to um, to look at the work. I'm thinking of God's reptilian finger, but um, mm -hmm. I think the same could be said for, for many of the works and some of the readings that I had made of um, the works that then when I told you what I was thinking, you said, well, it wasn't really, that, that wasn't what I was thinking about at all. Mm -hmm. um, what did you show then? That you, do you think there's a difference then in what you were showing at um, the Art, Art Institute of Chicago, knowing that you couldn't have uh, written material around it, or that knowing that you were kind of free from mm -hmm. that? Well, I think coming out of Emily Carr, I was, um, at least when I was there, um, we, we wrote a lot. And then also it was more like, um, it was more like, um, oh, I forget. It was it was more like the school of thought um, was maybe more linked to French thinkers. So we were trying to explain a lot and blah, blah, blah. And then um, in SAIC, the, the, the thought was more uh, Frankfurt school. And I don't know, it was, it was a different way of speaking about art. So, um, uh, but yeah, yeah, when, but when we showed art, um, we weren't allowed to, because that work had to stand by itself. So I think it was a good balance in the education. Mm -hmm. And also, I guess when I've shown in um, Europe and Latin America, which is mostly where I've shown, um, yeah, I, I haven't provided those materials, not even with my commission with uh, Corpus Network, which all the works are really personal. Um, but when I've shown in North America, I do. So there's a difference. And I I think uh, for a long time, I avoided showing more often in Canada because I knew, or even applying for Canada Consul Grants because I knew I had to justify the piece sometimes before I made it. And in the US, it's often... Um, you know, it's often within this, um, the fact that I'm Latin American. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, but you know, but you get more comfortable as you go. But then, you know, with the new museum show, which I did have the option to not provide any, well, I didn't provide any biographical thing. I just spoke about this um, ethnic group, which has mm, been really um, screwed over <laughs> last 200 years. So there, I, I think it was me for me was more like, my intention was more to get people aware of these these people's history. So I took an opportunity more to, oh yeah, in the text that I made, uh, people could find out about uh, the Achi people and, um, and how they're now homeless because of uh, this uh, hydroelectric dam. So I, I, I guess for me it was, it was there, but I didn't, there was nothing apart from the fact that I'm Guatemalan, that was really um, about me. Mm -hmm. But, but you know, I could have provided no text, but the text was important. Yeah. Yeah. I guess that there's a particular, one of the new commissions uh, in the exhibition, so we commissioned three new um, pieces uh, for this show, and one of the works is, it is very autobiographical, really, right, the, the Kakashte piece. Um, maybe you could explain a bit about where your interest in the form of the Kakashte came from and how it manifested in this new work. Um, I'm not sure, really. Um, well, I, th I think it started because I, I saw some elderly man carrying a Kakashte up a hill 
And I, I was really shocked. I don't know, because I hadn't seen that scene for a long time. I forgot about it. And then, coincidentally, I was in a co-op where they, people go and sell their stuff. And there was a kakashite for sale. And I was, I was like, oh, that's what I just saw. And then I just started uh, researching about it, and I was really interested in the fact that uh, kakashite, which is um, sort of like a grid, a wooden, well, traditionally a wooden grid or a bamboo grid, which you can strap to your back um, in the most simple form as a, almost like a backpack, um, that um, it, was, it was both in um, central Mexican languages, both a word, and like a glyph and a thing, and it, it meant caring. So it was really interesting that you can make a form and it was also a word. Mm -hmm. So then, um, and I really got into Kakash, like reading about Kakashte, and then I, I saw um, this painting by um, Fedri Jean Frederic Valdec, mm -hmm. and then, um, and I was well, I was really. Um, Disgusted uh, was this uh, Jean Frederick Valdec. I don't know if I'm saying that right. He's um, he was an early 19th century Franco-German uh, person. Um, he was kind of a, a con artist, and um, he got a commission in the 1830s, 1840s, to come to Mexico and and the region, which was Guatemala. I mean, Chiapas was Guatemala then. Um, to l document the, um, the pyramids, and he was one of the first people to to depict um, the glyphs. And of course, um, he was responsible for a long time uh, misint misinterpretation of the glyphs because he saw elephants and see, see he saw other things. And he also, um, like the Mormons later, he had an agenda to prove that um, there was an ancient lost Israeli tribe that, you know, he was really into that. But anyway, he has this portrait of himself moving through the mountains in Chiapas, being carried by an indigenous man um, in a modified kakashte. So yeah, that was really like, uh, so there was a lot of history there. And um, yeah, so that was, and I also interested in Oh, let's say there was a protest last year uh, about the president in um, a small town in Guatemala, and uh, people put a figure of the president on uh, one of those chairs on their backs. Oh, wow. So that was like, oh wow, like, like a cash, that thing is still in the consciousness of people, and also, um, yeah, I also s saw this uh, mural. Um, Diego Rivera did this mural about the 1954 invasion of the U.S. in Guatemala. And there's actually those chairs also in that painting in the background, and I, I never noticed them before until I found out about that thing. So, okay, so the Kakashte, I, 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 I've um, taken the story no. a long way. Uh, yeah, but I was also interested in the Kakashte in, uh, uh, before colonialism, uh, because in... in in Mayan and um, Central Mexican art, the kakashte mostly carries spiritual things like the sky or almost like cornucopia carrying all that's good in the world so that the kakashte could, not, could, could be outside of this um, awfulness of um, <coughs> forced uh, to carry things that are too heavy for you. Anyway. Okay, sorry. I no, oh yeah, yeah. So the, this so is so right. this kakashte, I um, well the first kakashte I made. Oh my God, it's all gonna be about kakashte. <laughs> the first kakashte I made was um, in winter two thousand eighteen, I think. I made it at M Museum in Leuven in Brussels, and. Um, I had had this experience where I was at the Musée de Branly. I don't know if I'm saying that right. And then I was looking at some Nigerian um, figures in a window display, in a window 
cabinet, but they're they're double, you know, they're you know they're all around. And then I saw this um, man of um, Afro African descent across from me, and I thought, oh, he looks like my godfather. But then I thought, I cannot be my grand godfather. I'm in Paris. But anyway. <laughs> He later WhatsApped me and said, oh, I saw this young man, and he looks so much like you, blah, blah, blah. And then, oh, but I, when I was looking at the Nigerian things, I was thinking about him because he, he's Afrocentric, or he's really into um, Nigeria and also um, the heritage of that in Latin America, and blah, blah, blah. So then, um, yeah, and then I was interested in this, these objects that we were both looking at. Um, and then we were projecting <coughs> these narratives of uh, being Guatemalan or, or him being of um, African descent in Guatemala. And um, by, by how these objects, uh, we were imposing our own interpretation on it. But of course, it was a necessary interpretation because of the whole um, programming of um, taking culture away from people that such a projection was okay, I think. So then in, in, the, in the M Museum, I basically made a kakashte with a bunch of objects that I project myself onto in this kind of ethnographic museums. And, but for this kakashte, because it was my first big show in Canada, blah, 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 and because uh, I came to Canada as a refugee with my grandmother, I wanted to make, a, you know, make it more... Um, more specific, and um, originally I wanted to make a kakashte about um, the objects they give you as refugees when you come here, but um, but it ended up being more objects that um, that told a story about um, my grandmother's life uh, before coming here and then here and and things like that. So, anyway. And if you w was anyone here at the opening last night, Nalfus did a really amazing and moving performance in which he um, unwrapped the objects from the kakashte so they were all uh, bound up um, onto the um, onto the grid structure and then now has unfurled them gradually so um, all of these objects which somehow as they're unfurled start to paint a picture of really of an individual and the kind of objects that one uh, accumulates around oneself, um, whether they're practical or uh, decorative sometimes, or so there's like a tiny little um, elephant because she collected elephants, right? Um, and there's uh, the tree of life, that um, the kind of religious little memento, I guess. Um, and then things like uh, bottles of perfume, of uh, med different medications. There's a bedpan. There's a quite small crutch, um, <laughs> shoes and a hat and things. All of these things which really um, I'm interested, I guess, in the way that they all um, have a bodily relationship. You know, they're all somehow objects which are appendages or uh, how they, they have a connection to the body, I think, and they, they make us think about how we kind of construct our, um, ourselves through these objects. So it was amazing to see, um, to see you unfurling that, and it felt very significant that it was happening here to me. Um, there was an, there's another work which is related to that which now was made for um, for the power plant exhibition, um, which is inspired by um, another kind of structure which really has to do with um, with carrying and uh, the idea of um, of what the, what the kind of processes of carrying and of extraction and of shifting uh, material, whether it's cultural or uh, natural, from one place to the other, and the kind of insidious ways that um, that that happened under um, uh, under Spanish rule in um, in Central America. Um, I wonder whether you could explain a bit about the bed. Okay. Um. Well, I've, I've become really interested in plants and also in the transportation of plants. 
um, so, um, but, and that's, that's become other projects as well, or future projects. Um, but I was interested in um, the history of this uh, Ward case, which was a 19th century innovation to be able to trans transport um, uh, plants from uh, colonies or, or countries that um, that were intended to be co colonized or hope hopefully colonized by different European powers. And um, yeah, but then at the same time, I, uh, when I was thinking how I illegal it is to transport plants across borders without the right permits, um, because I, I am a plant collector and I, I've been having a hard time expanding my collection in Guatemala. There's a, there's a few plant collectors, but they don't want to share their plants, which I, I totally understand. But um, the but way to do it apparently now. <laughs> I don't want to mention anything. Uh, <laughs> but uh, okay. But okay. there was a well-known, well, but discreet um, orchid thief in this. 60s, 70s, who, uh, while stealing plants from uh, South America, lived partly in Guatemala. So you, you, you can sometimes find um, plants which are now extinct in Colombia, in Guatemala, sometimes randomly in nurseries for normal prices. So it's become less about this internet shopping of plant, rare plants to more like going to going to nurseries all over the country, trying to find one. And anyway, so, but I was also thinking about in Vancouver, um, the Guatemalan community uh, was granted use of a little bit of land from UBC um, in the 80s uh, to build um, our own garden. So we called it the Maya Garden. It's, I think, also other um, other groups in in Vancouver, also a lot were also allotted part of land. I think um, I forget what countries, but also as obscure as Guatemala. So, <laughs> so we used to go there and and plant and, and you know and, and the plant the seeds that we snaked into Canada for the different herbs and vegetables that we eat and other Latinos don't eat. Then we were able to grow them and. Um, and also the, the group was, because most Guatemalans are, are Mayan indigenous, so of course they, um, it, was, it was a nice group. Um, and um, so yeah, so this Wardian case that I made here is more with uh, plant, Guatemalan plants uh, that we legally sourced the seeds. <laughs> and, um, and just to have a mini, mini garden that is in a case that reminds one of the Wardian case but doesn't have the the awfulness of this um, late 18th century, 19th century um, mm, transportation of plants. I mean, I mean, one of the most interesting ones, which I hope to make a project, but maybe I'm jinxing it now by speaking about it in a speak, in a thing like this, is that, um, was really interested and I became, one of my other hobbies has become collecting tea, collecting Chinese tea. And uh, of course an expensive hobby which I've had to um, cool off. Um, and also in Guatemala I'm not often tempted to drink tea except in the cold months. <laughs> but, um, <clears throat> um, well the history you know of, of, the, um, of England uh, purposely training somebody to learn perfect uh, Chinese and to dress like a Chinese person and then um, steal some tea trees, which tea trees were... Um, <clears throat> uh, the Chinese emperor did not allow anybody to take uh, trees uh, away from China. So this is a common story, but if I forget his name. He, um, he, he stole some trees and then uh, also, I think, enslaved or forcefully transported um, some people from Yunnan into India to, uh, to, 
to take away the monopoly of uh, the Chinese of having tea. And um, <clears throat> some of these trees ended up really soon after in Guatemala, like only like seven years after this um, theft. Um, so yeah, so that was a really interesting uh, other story. And, um, and I love the region in Guatemala where there's tea trees because it's, um, it's very hilly and it's, um, it has really nice trees and it's often uh, foggy. So uh, one of my dreams is to live in that region. But anyway, I I'm meandering. No. But this is another history yeah, that I'm interested in. And uh, also the, the main uh, tree uh, plantation which was um, made by German immigrants, um, is, is now a cooperative uh, run by um, indigenous Guatemalans. So it's great that we came from this colonial awful project to uh, like even the enslavement of Chinese peoples so they could know how to grow the tea to uh, now being a, a co-op. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anyway, uh, sorry. There's a sense of... Uh, Repurposing and re uh, reframing objects which have these uh, very sinister and violent histories um, in light of a th there's really a, a sense of optimism I think in both the Kakashte work and the bed um, work which um, which I think very powerfully comes across. So the horror is uh, the horror is perhaps suppressed more in this work than um, than in some of the others um, in the show. I want to talk about the other work that we commissioned um, for the exhibition, which is a new um, video of a performance which Snuff has made with um, a number of collaborators um, and filmed last November, December. December. Yeah, very recently um, in Guatemala City. Um, we just include, like, put up one image um, of the exhibition across the way, um, which is the costumes from uh, Heart of the Scarecrow um, from this performance. Um, and this is a work which really has had multiple iterations. The project began, it began with the prints, right? That was the... F with the etchings, the f that was the first thing that um, that now was made, and then the costumes, and then a live performance. No, then the poetry came in, and then the live performance, and now this iteration of the video. Um, do you, Do you want to explain the story of how you came to? came to Heart of the Scarecrow. Oh yeah, maybe I won't make it so biographical, but um, <laughs> um, yeah, there was this uh, play, um, a student um, art put on by art school students um, from the Universidad Popular in Guatemala City in 75, and it's the most violent instance of censorship of the arts during the whole war. Um, the violence was such to an extent that um, um, the theater was bombed, so it, the, all the roof burned. And also um, people after that were hesitant about doing experimental or political plays. And I th many people say that the trauma can still be felt now uh, because Guatem Guatemalan theater in the 60s and 70s um, was really uh, forward looking. I think that's how maybe it was maybe the medium that was most innovative. And um, it had interesting titles like, well, The Heart of the Scarecrow or The Indigestible uh, Fish, or The wow. Fish That Cannot Be Digested. <laughs> and also um, trial, and judge, uh, trial and Execution of a Chicken is another one. Do you know what those plays were like? Is there a memory yeah. of them? Yeah, I mean, those plays are still put on. I don't know how they were in the original. They're probably more experimental in the original thing. I know that trial trial and um, judgment of a chicken is quite controversial, and I don't think people do it much. The, basically, there's a it's a courtroom uh, drama, and there's a chicken on the stand uh, being accused of um, 
being a terrorist and uh, plotting against the state. And the chicken just, wah, 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 you know, just <laughs> wah, whatever they do. And then at the end, all the judges decide that the chicken is actually guilty and they kill the chicken on stage. So the, the play is not uh, staged anymore. Or, uh, no, I don't think anybody allows it to be staged anymore. But yeah. So it's a real chicken? Yeah. And they wow. let the chicken splatter blood all over the audience. I mean, all over the, yeah. So, so you uh, didn't choose to restage that? I do want to. <laughs> How can I not? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, we'll have to see. Of course, I will not kill a chicken, but but it's a. It sounds like it's a great. <laughs> it's it's a great uh, work. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you 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 can put the feathers in your arm, maybe. And <laughs> oh, that's you true. You yeah. don't want to um, <laughs> to take on that role, though, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess it reminds me of this legend of this performance in Vancouver about Sniffy the rat. I don't know if you heard about no. him. I forget what artist did it. Does anybody remember here? <laughs> well, oh, you remember. Which is the artist? Oh, yeah. Well, since performance is supposed to survive a lot in rumor and um, badly remembered memory, I'll, t I'll tell my, my unqualified inheritance of this memory is that this artist announced, I don't know when, the 70s or 80s, that he was going to drop Sniffy from a tall building, like the death of Sniffy. And then um, there was a massive protest to uh, stop him. And even they, I heard that they chased him around Vancouver on the streets to try to stop him. But his intention was never to kill Sniffy. But yeah. Just to um, provoke people yeah, into provoke. hysteria around. But it sounds fun. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so we've avoided provoking hysteria around oh, a yeah. potential oh, death yeah. of a so, chicken. So hard so of a far. scarecrow. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I wanted to, um, you know, there was in uh, in the original commission commissions for the performance in Sao Paulo and LACMA. Um, well, the costumes were made in Sao Paulo and in Sao Paulo everything is three times more expensive than here. So then um, the fabrication of the costumes was like 10,000 each, like it was really expensive. And then, um, so there was no budget to, to make a you know, make a document of it, and uh, which is really important to me. So, I, uh, but then when I thought about, you know, when, where do I want to make a video about it, I felt it had to be in the theater um, where the censorship happened and where the bomb happened. So then, um, yeah, so I was, um, I was lucky enough um, to sort of like find a way to get access to the theater um, and then the the daughter, the, the current director is the daughter of the director in 1975. So um, there was this thing about remembering and also not remembering because the censorship was so uh, profound that um, no photo documentation, as far as we have found out, uh, survived and also the script is lost, if there was a script at all. Maybe it was too experimental to have a script. And um, so then that gave way for me and Winston to, Winston is the poet whom I asked to write a poem, which I, uh, and who also plays uh, the scarecrow in the video, um, to, uh, to really do what we wanted. And, um, um, but of course, uh, now that the video was just finished being edited, um, well, we just received the video yesterday. <laughs> then um, me and Winston noticed how there was no element of revolution in our work or no element of, um, you know, nothing that maybe the 75 production we think might have had about provoking change. It was more about, I think our, our, our heart of the Scarecrow is more about what it's like to navigate 
the world in um in the world that we've always known where it's um in the world that we live in now with the rise of the new right and uh globally and also um this kind of um speech that people have um um in order to uh avoid um speaking about uh hard issues um yeah but um and then um yeah so it's interesting but i'm i'm also hoping that um since in the sao paulo and los angeles and now the video interpretation there are all different performances that in the future other performers can can put on the costumes and make their own heart of the scarecrow um but yeah but it was nice to uh with wingston to sit down and decide what part of his really long poem to to use and to make a structure and to make uh, a version that we had more control over yeah and the the characters of the play um they're really archetypes that translate to um to any current or or past really political or future uh scenario so there's um the president the church the oligarchy and the soldier and these are the uh really the four villains that are um at the heart of uh at the heart of the play and it was very interesting what you were saying about uh when you made the performance in uh in LA and when you made the performance uh in Sao Paulo how audiences really brought their own interpretations to the play and did weren't thinking at all about um it necessarily about its performance in 1975 in Guatemala but was were saying well this is about what's happening to us right now so there's a sense in which the archetypes can rather disturbingly i suppose continue to relate very precisely to things that are going on now I think the play is and the the performance is really um and it's incredibly powerful the way that the characters are um somehow they're existing in these they they are villains but um now for said uh they're villains but they're also victims so they're somehow uh confined in these uh kind of grotesque costumes and they're um they're kind of grappling with being within these uh these identities The thing that I really love about the way um you've chosen to display them the way they've been also displayed in the past um is that they do become effigy like so the faces are stuffed with straw they really feel like uh not just uh, a display of uh performance costumes but they really become uh very potent sculptural objects in themselves that have um that have a sense of uh the kind of haunting effigy um about them what the, how are we doing okay i want what what else do we want to talk about i want to, i want to talk about god's reptilian finger because this is a work which uh i suppose has a in a way it has a different formal language to some of the other works in the show and it really is uh an immersive environment that um that gives uh introduces a very different kind of pace i suppose um to the exhibition um and also really brings uh to me a sense of uh a total kind of collapsing and uh exploding of uh conspiracy theory religious mythology archaeology and exploding of all of these kind of belief systems which i think is a very uh useful way to then go about thinking about the other dissections of history um in the rest of the exhibition maybe you could explain where it uh where it emerged from this work um well it emerged from a residency i did in weimar i think in 2012 or 13 i don't remember i think it was 12 and um um it was like the worst winter in 300 years in weimar so there was a lot of snow but i had a really nice um i had a really nice uh, um apartment which was um 
this 19th century building that was always meant for artists. So it had a, a nice Belle Epoque kind of garden and, and stuff. And also elevators that just paintings fit in. So it was, it was, and ac across my, my room when I, I lay down, there was the pavilion of, um, oh, I forget who. But um, it was the, um, the counts or the dukes of the area. And um, in, the, in the mausoleum, which is the largest mausoleum in the cemetery, there is the um, uh, Guta is buried there and also Shilla. And so then, or, or, the, or the missing, or the missing, well, yeah. And then I had like these dreams about, um, because Shilla's head is missing, no? So then I had this dream where um, I, I, cr I went down into the crypt and there was a, a plinth with a, with a vessel and um, this molten liquid, like molten jade flowing off it. And there was the skull of Schiller, which, oh, which is made of jade and then the liquid just melted off it. So uh, yeah, so it was a very um, dreamy, uh, winter-bound residency. <laughs> And I also watched lots of conspiracy theories uh, videos, and I really got into this whole reptilian uh, race conspiracy theory. And, um, and I also ordered books so I could be more um, critical about <laughs> how conspiracy theories function. Um, yeah, and then I, I wanted to do this um, installation about um, this thing and also conflated with um, with uh, Mormon uh, mythology, specifically um, about the an the ancient American roots of Mormonism mm -hmm. and the projection of their archaeology. So I, pr I proposed this first to because um, Okwi, when it was his biennial, he asked me for proposals. I proposed it for him, and I was like, "Oh, this is my strongest proposal. I hope he likes it." But he he didn't accept it. So then, uh, so I had this proposal for. A bit, and then the gas works came out, and um, or commission, and then I I was able to realize it for then. But I did do a miniature version in my studio in like 2014. Um, yeah, so I don't know. I just wanted to play with um, with something which is more about um, yeah, this kind of like trashy information and. Also, a lot of people who make these videos, I think maybe they come from places in society where they feel a bit, they, they don't have a voice. But I got that feeling from watching all these YouTube videos. So their voice was uh, these conspiracies. And also they go really deep, like they go really deep, like almost like in a dream, like that the origins of this reptilian race, um, which runs the world is, uh, this affair that Hercules had with this uh, serpent woman in uh, Scythia, and that um, two, one of her ch children became the king of Scythia, and the two others went abroad, and the two others are the ancestors of all the monarchy in, in uh, you know, in Europe. So yeah, it, it really went deep, deeper than uh, Ike, you know, who's the who's the guy who really has made a living off it. Mm -hmm. And also, I don't know, yeah, so it, it was fun to, since I was in this residency, having all these dreams to also go into people's narratives. And oh, I was also interested in how, I mean, at the core of it, I think, is how um, you, you put a bunch of words together and suddenly you get a narrative. Mm -hmm. And how I think any narrative can quickly fall apart. And... Um, in any way, in like in any fashion, so yeah. So by colliding the notion of a reptilian race and the notion that uh, the origins of Christianity are to be found in the Mayan pyramids, one kind of reveals yeah. the the absurdity of both of them. I think, yeah. and the and it was also interesting to. You know, when you look at John Smith, there's evidence that um, because Mayan, many Mayan pyramids were on Earth in 18, the 1840s or 1830s, that apparently he was really into these new newspaper news while he was writing the Book of Mormon so that 
in the same time that Frederick, Jean Frederick Baldeck was mm -hmm. in, in Guatemala and Chiapas uh, being carried by indigenous people on his back and interpreting um, ancient, um, you know, lost uh, Israeli connections to the Americas that, you know, John Smith was writing his, his, uh, his book. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was interesting. Well, now to look at that, you know, it's this, is this period of time, um, yeah. One thing I wanted to to shift perhaps slightly as a last question um, was about um, your performance work and the question of when you perform yourself and when you involve other people. So when you when you've uh, made collaborative works and worked with Winston Winston, for instance, um, how do you make those decisions? Um. I guess I, I I do it as who can best um, who can best say this thing, mm -hmm. and um, also I think since from the beginning I started performing uh, at nineteen, I was exposed to a lot of um, senior performance artists from Canada. Like I remember, I was twenty and I came with my friend Irene to see a performance by Tanya Mars about her. Uh, being an older performer and blah 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 and you know maybe and then also um, I forget somebody else in Vancouver had a com I guess M Margaret Dragu was also vocal about her being an older woman performing although they were not older but <laughs> 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 that was 20 years ago um, so yeah I was always conscious that apparently my experiences as a performance artist would change as I got older. And I think as I get older, sometimes I, um, I just want to involve other people. And also some of my, perform some of my performances, like um, the one where I sleep with a bunch of bananas or the brief history of architecture exist as instructions, which don't, don't need me. Mm -hmm. So they're um, in the instructions were collected by the Guggenheim, which is the first time they collected instructions, which was strange for me to to know because I would think they had more instructions, but um, also the fact that things could be an instruction and not be, you know, be um, relieved of me. So was it the first performance work that they collected? Which was only words. Which didn't require um, <laughs> the, the artist to... Yeah. To performance mm -hmm. and I also part of their collecting was uh, the patterns for making the costumes in the future so yeah so that was interesting but so yeah to to get it away from me which I think is okay um, another performance which I made um, Fino Fantasma which I made originally also in Sao Paulo at Casa, um, Casa de Povo um, was performed was staged in um, is it Malba in uh, Barcelona or uh, yeah Macba is it yeah I, I'm confused yeah. but anyway yeah they they redid it without me and apparently it was it was really uh, moving to people so <laughs> would there be some works that you would be that you feel comfortable being performed by others and some that would still have to be you. No, I think they can be performed by others. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you know, whether the thing about um, that we talked about, if somebody were to carry the kakashte, and then originally the idea was that Guatemalan women f living in Toronto would carry the kakashte, then the, you you guys brought up the thing about uh, you know how that might be problematic, and I was also interested in that with my Toronto Biennial Commission with this. Um, variations on this uh, chair that people were strapped to people's uh, backs because there was interest in uh, a ballet company doing something with them. Oh, wow. But, um, but I'm still not sure, you know, how that can function. And I'm, I'm kind of glad that the kakashte I made from Power Plant is too heavy for anybody um, 
but maybe the rock to carry <laughs> uh, to uh, that it's impossible to carry i think that's nice so the performance instruction for that when the work is uh, acquired by a museum <laughs> is that they have to bring in the rock to yes, um, yes. to carry it and unfurl it because <laughs> yeah, i couldn't carry it so yeah <laughs> Maybe a couple of people. Yeah, it was very interesting, I think, the discussions that we were having around, like, what does it mean to ask someone else to carry this thing, which is uh, metaphorically heavy with uh, the history of who has, who has carried it. Um, I think we should have questions at this point, um, or comments, or, um, yeah. Um, thank you very much for a great conversation. Um, I actually have a couple of questions. Wow, this is really loud. Um, one uh, that's very specific about the work where you paint someone uh, blue, like with the blue paint. Um, the question is what the paint meant, the act of painting, and also why that specific blue. Um, the other question is, um, all the other uh, videos where there is like an element of a dream, I think, you know, like I, that's what I understood at least, like that um, they all incorporate some of your dreams. Um, how do the dreams manifest in the, f in the work? Is there like a, a filtering process or are we actually seeing your dream more or less staged? So. First question. <laughs> um, well, I guess going back to art school, when I went to art school, uh, we didn't use green screen, we used blue screen. And that specific blue is chroma blue, which you can make uh, transparent in, uh, in, uh, you know, after you're done editing. So I was interested in f first that this blue uh, was something uh, that possibly I could be erasing the image of, of this um, young person that I'm painting. But uh, the other thing is that the color is so bright and out of place, which is why it was used in green screen, that um, I, I could be highlighting him. So that reminded me of uh, also going back to school. I took a course on um, war photography. So we had to read lots of books on um, how trauma um, manifested them itself in um, in photography and so then uh, and about something that just you know either either it blends in or it's something that stands out in uh, trauma in general but I'm, of course I'm not a trauma expert but I was just referring back to those thoughts on it and um, and also um, in the art that came immediately after the war and with artists that were based in Guatemala. Um, there was a lot of aesthetics of black and white. And, um, and since uh, biographically I'm a war survivor, then, uh, and also uh, something I mentioned before was all the humor that goes along with war survivors or even you know, even with Irene's mom, who was an evacuation baby, um, how, um, you know, there's this humor, you know, with this hard thing in this biography. So, um, yeah. And then the second question is, um, um, well, you know, I, I could just say nothing, you know, like, it's an option. Uh, <laughs> I could keep my mouth shut, you know. And, um, but, um, um, I guess I, I do believe in um, original images and I do believe in the continuation of art. So um, I think dreams to me um, or imagination or visions um, 
do contribute to my art practice and I do something I believe in. Um, sometimes I feel like this whole idea that nothing new can happen or that there's no space for new images is, I don't know, it sounds like you're just watching too much TV and maybe it's some kind of uh, capitalist propaganda. I don't know, it just sounds weird. Like, of course there's new images. Uh, of course, uh, sometimes you hear music that doesn't exist in your head, you know, like uh, there's still creativity. So anyway. You kind of already, um, this is so loud. You kind of already spoke a bit about this just now, but I wanted to maybe ask about the use of humor in your work and where that comes from and why it's important to you to insert moments of reprieve or humor, uh, both in your performances and in your installations. Um, yeah, if you would like to speak about that. Um, yeah, I, th I think I responded, you know, like this whole thing about when you're amongst other people that live through things, um, you do share moments of uh, funniness. And um, I'm very suspicious when something is so serious, you know, or like the narrative's completely sad and there's only it's only going one way. Then I think, oh, this is not coming from somebody who actually knows what it is. Um, and um, yeah, uh, maybe I, I think it's maybe not so authentic. Um, so then, um, also maybe I, I just I'm I just you know I, I laugh at my own jokes a lot. So maybe I'm just funny. And um, <clears throat> recently, one of my uncles uh, who lives in Vancouver um, went over to the to the town where um, he was born. And um, and then um, he went to vi he went to find his um, uncle who's now very old, like ninety or eighty something. And then his um, his uncle is a is a notary, a bilingual notary in Quiche Maya and in Spanish. And so then my my uncle noticed how his uncle wouldn't really talk to him because who's this stranger? So he started speaking to him in Quiche, saying, oh, blah, 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 blah. And by the way, I'm your nephew. And then um, where is this going? Where's the story going? Oh, yeah, but anyway, <laughs> his, his uncle had like a, a heart attack that day. And it was my uncle who took him to the hospital. And then apparently in the hospital, my uh, grand uncle now is uh, just full of jokes, like nonstop jokes. That, the day he had a heart attack, so I think it's also, you know, heritage. Yes, anyway. I wondered how it felt to see all of this work together for the first time. It's obviously, the, you know, the, these are um, selected works from the past decade. We're in no way being comprehensive about uh, reflecting what you've been doing, but how does it feel? feel to see it together? Um, yeah, I'm not sure how I feel like. Um, I heard a long time ago, 20 years ago, from somebody who had a, who had a show like this, that um, he got depressed and then didn't know how to go on. <laughs> but uh, those feelings have not come up. <laughs> I think it's because I... I have a lot of work to do this year, so then I'm just like I need to get to work. I need to, I need to get back to. I need to <laughs> get back to uh, drawing and and blah blah blah. I just need to go on, you know. And so then, and um, 
maybe it helped uh, with this new museum book that came out, with had a lot of my work also from the last ten years, to uh, to see in one thing, you know, what I've done. Of course, not everything because they didn't include any of my drawings or or uh, woodcuts. But anyway, nothing can be so uh, so. Uh, con what is it called? Complete. Yeah, because I, I mean, uh, printing, um, you know, printmaking, and those things are, are really fun for me. But anyway, <laughs> or works on paper, so anyway. But um, um, it's fine, you know. <laughs> or I also do some sound pieces, and how do you include sound in a book, you know? You can't, you know, or anyway. Ah, <laughs> yeah, that, you were talking about age and, you know, the changes on you about performance, but in general, how would you describe aging and looking back on the pieces or arts or performance that you had in a young, young, young ages? How would you see that? It's, can you tell us more about it? Well, in 2013, um, the house that one of my uncles had bought in Vancouver, where I stored all my art, um, burned down. So I lost everything I did in my 20s and early 30s. So then, um, yeah, I guess that's one of the things why things go back only 10 years. But um, but part of me thinks it's a good thing, you know, that all that, all that disappeared because... Um, I'm not sure whether it was good art or not, but I, I was very prolific in my 20s, like almost a performance a week, no, a, a month. So, um, yeah, and I, um, so I cannot look back that far and uh, whatever embarrassing things I might have done in my 20s might not have survived. So, so it is it is a relief. Um, although I'm I'm having a, a show later this year in the f first place where I showed um, internationally. So it it when I it was it would be funny to um, do something there because um, I'm not sure the video of what I did there um, 18 years ago or whatever survived. Um, but anyway, sorry, I, I went on a thing. So yeah, there, I mean, there's not really. Uh, I've been very prolific this past 10 years, but um, going further, there's not much. Yeah. And then. Uh, I'm just wondering, uh, even if you think about that, who you think your audience is, and I guess I'm thinking about um, where your voice is coming from, because sometimes some works seem very Guatemala and, s and some don't. Mm -hmm. Some look are formal and they look uh, that, you know, they fit into a, a white cube, I guess. Mm. So well, Guatemalan art since the 20s has been really formal. It's really funny. Like, the things that Guatemalans like are like clean geometry, you know, uh, clean, clean messages and um, and ways of expressing. So it's it's really different in a way than um, than the history of other Latin American countries where it's been more crazy or more fun and maybe more images of trees. So um, um, I think, you know, like, I think, yeah, I think when when uh, this house burned down and blah, 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 I just, well, I think forever, I just, for every new commission that I have, I, um, I just do what I want in that moment without thinking about it much. And, um, and I, when I, I did start to show my art more 10 years ago in Guatemala City. I was surprised how people, uh, how many people got it, you know, like, and um, especially how many children like going to my exhibitions. So, um, I, um, yeah, I think Guatemalans love the formality. Um, and, um, and they're, yeah, I try to ignore that because I, I show in a lot of places. And I cannot be self-conscious about whether um, some people in Korea might not get it or things like that, you know. Like, of course they'll get it. 
or something. They'll get something. Yeah. Anyway. Um, oh. okay. I guess the question um, uh, I had was like about uh, this concept of biography. What I find interesting about it is less the biography and more the the strategies around biography, like the kind of uh, resistance, the enveloping of it, the emotions. Um, so like pushing against it or um, uh, sidestepping in a way. Like I think it's very interesting in terms of what is biography in relation to art and um, is it like a, I mean, there's a whole history of that, but is it a colonizing strategy in some ways or a exoticizing or of one's life or self or, I'm not sure, but I just wondered if you had any comments about the politics of the emotions. Or? Well, um, I, I don't know. Well, I, when I mentioned your mother, I got a little bit emotional, I think, because um, it was a relation, um, an understanding. So, um, and it's weird, you know, because different generations. So, um, I try to avoid that because I, um, um, audiences don't deserve that kind of vulnerability from oneself. Um, it's too tabloid. It's too, you know, I think a big luxury now is to, is to have privacy and have one's own thoughts and have one's own private space. And um, yeah, and I, I think in um, in grad school, I I I'd had a very emotional thing, um, and then the <clears throat> the counselor just said, oh, maybe you should just avoid these themes in your art. But it's kind of like, but since I I move um, um, within whatever I want in that moment, whatever I want to make art out of, then I cannot stop that just because it's too p emotional or personal. But I, I just maybe, I don't have to mention it that much or emphasize it because, of course, I, I don't want to feel like awful afterwards. But I, but I do want the freedom to s speak of those things that might be emotional for me. It even, you know, it, it might not be... Um, obvious to other people, but I think it, but I think in all of us, you know, like, um, if you're a curator, <laughs> you might propose a theme and the actual source of that, that theme might be a dream or it might be an emotion or something, but of course you're not going to share it. I mean, for curators, it's uh, not very usual that they, um, reveal them, their motives or themselves. Um, and when they do, sometimes it's a bit weird. So uh, <laughs> so I think it's just that also in our, uh, as artists, we have this luxury to refer more to ourselves, but also for me, um, you know, to uh, balance that with uh, what I say. And uh, yeah, sometimes, you know, with if I can't dance with, in the corpus, um, every time we did something, I warned them about, because um, it was a very personal commission, I warned them not to push me too much and also um, um, to respect in the text what I wanted to say or not. Because, um, and let's say I did this performance at KW in Berlin and it was very, um, it came from a very emotional and personal origin. And there was no artist statement given to the audience. And even now, uh, the official text of that performance is ambiguous. And um, I mean, um, Germans, I guess, because of their history and whatever, or other people, either because um, they've been through institutions, they really uh, got into it and they thought it was about a specific thing, which had nothing to do with me. But I think that was okay, you know, it was okay. Um, so with, you know, also Lauren's thing about the, ex the, ex the rocks being part of architecture is, is fine. But anyway, yeah. Anyway, I think there was a, another, uh, yeah, qu one more? Yeah, I'm going to see the work after the talk, so it's not about the work, but I'm looking, really look after the talk, thank you. I'm looking so much 
I'm really looking forward to spending the afternoon next door. Um, but I wanted to ask you a little bit about your choice to live in Guatemala. We know there was sort of like a whole national period, then an exile period, and then the kind of all the questions in the 90s, is there such a thing as a Latin American artist anymore? Because there was sort of like Berlin, Spain here, and I know you travel, but what's it like living in Guatemala City, and is there a vibrant sort of emerging art scene? Maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, I think um, part of the reason why the last 10 years have been so nice to me is because I'm, I'm, I started to show in Guatemala, uh, I, I started to show, um, my first solo was in 2010 at Proyectos Ultravioleta. And um, yeah, and the Guatemalan community really took to me and they were excited. And um, and I think it, it um, yeah, it was, and I didn't have to explain much of what I was doing. So um, I, mean, I think for um, my, um, the productiveness of my uh, creativity it has been good to be there. Of course, um, yeah, of course it's it's not perfect. And, um, you know, when I, because I was living between Germany and Guatemala also the last 10 years, par part of the time now I'm just in Guatemala. But when I left Germany, um, people did tell me what, well, was I, was I, you know, I wouldn't get that many studio visits anymore, <laughs> and things like that. You know, um, and I, and of course, there's things that I miss about it, like, um, you know, the support that I didn't even ask for that suddenly came when I was in Berlin, um, and, um, mm, but as a principle, I, I wanted to. Uh, make my studio in Guatemala and produce from there, but of course now, um, because there's so much bureaucracy about getting art out of the country, then I'm not sure how that's going to work. But um, uh, what is your question and, and the thing? Ah, I mean, is there Latin American blah blah blah? Um, I don't know. That seems to be um, questions other people ask and. Um, and the Guatemalan art scene is very rich, and it has um, uh, a strong history and a, st a strong identity of what it likes and it was doesn't like. Like it likes, you know, clean things. It likes clean statements. Blah blah. Of course, I don't fit into that, but um, and um, you know, there there is a little bit more of an interest in, in the Guatemalan art scene. Like uh, with there was the show by Vivian Suter, who's um, a Swiss Austrian Guatemalan that's been living there most of her life, um, and um, also um, um, there's a book that's going to be published by um, Yale Press or something on the history of Guatemalan art coming out soon. So there is, um, yeah, but it's it's also nice to come from a scene that doesn't have a defined identity, like. Uh, which is, you know, in a way that's also nice. Um, oh, I was, uh, no, I was going to say something which might be offensive, but to Canadians, but it's also nice to make art as a Canadian because nobody really knows what we're going to make. So that Guatemalans have the same uh, luxury. You know, nobody expects you to make uh, a star bangled, you know, painting or something, you know. Anyway, yeah. So that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for all of your questions. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you, Lauren, for agreeing to share all of that with us. And um, yeah, I would urge everyone to go see the exhibitions. Um, this will definitely be super enlightening for everyone. Um, or confusing. Or confusing, <laughs> which is also good. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you.